The culture war is not some abstract philosophical duel fought by politicians seeking to carve up voting blocks. The culture war is a real war with real bodies. I know. I held one. Throughout history, whenever great injustices existed, youth movements have risen up to combat and end those injustices. You have organizations out there like the Center for Bioethical Reform. The Center for Bioethical Reform. Canadian Center for Bioethical Reform. Organizations like the Center for Bioethical Reform to receive public funds when they then use to attack a woman's right to choose. Abortion kills all kinds of people, so then all kinds of people can join the pro-life movement to save these babies. I was talking to a young man on the streets of Toronto. I spoke with a woman named Lucy about abortion. Today we were doing choice chain in downtown Regina. By the end of the conversation, she was completely pro-life. He then walked away 100% pro-life. Completely pro-life. We should remember that each of those babies that die every day in Canada not only have the right to life that's being violated, they also have the right to artifacts. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Pro-Life Guys podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. That opening quote was a stunning one, and it was by Jonathan Van Maren, our colleague here at the Canadian Centre for Bioethical Reform, that he wrote in his book, The Culture War, which we'll be referencing several times throughout this episode, because today we're going to be talking about the sexual revolution and how abortion fits within that revolution that's taken place over the last Oh man, it's been it's been over half a century now. Um, depends who you talk to, but uh, the, the, our culture and our society has certainly been been transforming for quite some time. Um, but this sexual revolution, many people say there's no bodies involved in this one, like in other revolutions. But we're going to be talking about how abortion is connected and how there are actually many bodies, uh, many dead bodies, as a result of this revolution. Before we get into that conversation, my name is Peter Boss. I am the host of the show. And with me again is my great friend and my good, great co-host, Cameron Cote. How are you today, sir? I'm doing well, Peter. How are you? I'm, I'm doing really good. Hopefully I can, uh, I'll be able to speak clearly. Um, good, great. I got some synonyms there, but hey. Uh, for those of you who are new to the podcast, we are two guys who are passionate about ending the killing of preborn children in Canada. And this podcast is dedicated to giving you the tools that you need to change hearts and minds on abortion. Along with that, we want to, we want, we want our listeners, we want you to be up to date and in the know about the abortion war, about what's happening, about where we've come from, about where we're going, and so on and so forth. And that's where this conversation from today is going to fit in. Before I introduce Jonathan Van Maren, our our guest today, uh, Cam, can you highlight how people could become a financial partner of the Pro-Life Guys, receive some pretty cool merch, and help us with our mission? Absolutely. So we are connected on Patreon. If you go to www.patreon.com slash prolifeguys, you can find the different tiers for how you can be a partner of the show. And your financial partnership allows us not only to reach more and more people, through this podcast, gets us on more platforms, gets us with more and more exciting and incredible guests, but it also allows us to get boots on the ground um, for having conversations about abortion on street corners and on doorsteps. And so your generous support is absolutely appreciated and absolutely necessary for us to continue uh, moving forward in the culture war, moving forward towards transforming our culture to one which rejects abortion in all situations. And so again, patreon.com slash pro-life guys. As Peter mentioned, you can get some pretty sweet swag there. We've got a whole bunch of stuff coming out um, in the, the coming weeks here. Um, some pretty cool announcements coming up. So stay tuned about that. But that's where you can find us. And, and every penny that you support goes towards either training more pro-lifers or putting those pro-lifers on street corners and on doorsteps. And so please do. And, and we look forward to, to connecting you with some of that sweet swag that you can get um, through the mail. I just want to say that at the time of recording, we're a few weeks out from the swag. But by the time this is released, um, that swag might be ready. Uh, so do go check it out. You could probably find it uh, on our website, prolifeguys.com or patreon.com, as Cam mentioned, patreon.com slash prolifeguys. Our guest today is the one and only Jonathan Van Maren of the Canadian Center for Bioethical Reform. We had him on episode number three, if, mem if memory serves correctly to talk about the importance of using abortion victim photography in our pro-life outreach. Today, we're going to be talking about the sexual revolution. 
uh, and abortion. Jonathan is a columnist, an author, a speaker, a podcaster, and an activist. He's a blogger on thebridgehead.ca. That's www.thebridgehead.ca. Go check it out. And there he covers a range of important topics from the state of the culture and human rights to literature and politics featuring cutting edge interviews with authors, journalists, culture warrior, journalists, culture warriors, and even historical figures. From, from Lord George Weidenfeld to Mark Stein, from North Korean defectors to Holocaust survivors, The Bridgehead brings a valuable and much needed perspective in a culture often forgetful of its own history www.thebridgehead.ca. Jonathan has also written a number of books. The one that's relevant for today is The Culture War, and it talks about uh, the sexual revolution and where we are in our current cultural moment. And Jonathan wrote it so that Christians can understand precisely, precisely how we got to this point so we can know uh, in many ways how we can fight against it. This is our conversation with Jonathan Van Maren. Jonathan, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us once again on the Pro-Life Guys podcast. Yeah, it's awesome to be back with you guys. Yeah, we agree. Now, we want to talk about abortion and the sexual revolution and a lot of the other cultural issues that conservatives and pro-lifers and Christians are facing today. But I have a question for you as we kick things off, and that is that a little over a decade ago or so, you started fighting abortion. You went on university campuses, you went downtown, you went to the places where people are to challenge them on the topic of abortion. But then the first book you came out with was called The Culture War, which you can find at thebridgehead.ca for anyone who's interested. And that book, while it touched on abortion, it talked about a, a, lo a lot larger of an issue. I mean, you talked about a whole bunch of other issues like pornography, you talked about commodity culture, the sexual revolution, and so on and so forth. So let me ask, what was it about the abortion conversation that made you look into these other issues? And then what was it that, you know, you thought they were so important to know that you wrote a book about them? Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question because a lot of people have assumed that like culture was always my area of interest and that I got involved with the pro-life movement because I saw that that's where the pressing need was. But that's not actually the case. Uh, with like my history degree from, from Simon Fraser University, my concentration was actually European history uh, as well as Middle Eastern history. And that was those were my primary interests, not the history of the sexual revolution, not how pornography affects our culture, how Margaret Mead and Alfred Kinsey and other intellectuals laid the groundwork for the sexual revolution. And so the reason I actually started researching those subjects is from going out on the streets with CCBR, from going out on campus with different pro-life groups. Uh, because honestly, I'd be, we'd be talking to these students and coming from a, a Christian home where we, we got brought up with sort of the, the basic sexual mores um, that were believed by most of Western civilization for the last 2000 years. I was having a lot of conversations that, that just struck me as, as particularly bizarre because of what the people I was talking to didn't seem to know. So, you know, I went to a Christian school where they did not have the sort of explicit sex education they have in most public schools. And therefore, my basic assumption would have been that people from public schools knew more about this stuff than I did. But I'd have guys on campuses like at the University of Calgary, the guy said to me, you know, I got my girlfriend pregnant. I don't even know how that happened. Um, and more and more, I was I was realizing that most people had just somehow like fundamentally divorced sex from procreation. And there had to be some sort of chasm in human history where we went from knowing this thing to not knowing this thing. And so that and a whole bunch of other things I was experiencing, especially during um, high school Choice Jane, which for those of you who don't know who Choice Jane is or what Choice Jane is, pardon me, it's just when we're outside high schools with our displays and engaging with teenagers, it's just the gaps in their knowledge were really interesting. And that sort of set me on course to research what the impact are. So how, how our culture started to think the way it thought. Because um, I realized that, that guys like ourselves are actually a bit of a, a hangover from a previous age when people still basically understood that sex made babies. Um, and in, in an age, some of us, me and Cam anyways, um, where the smartphone, the, ma the first major smartphone didn't come out until just after high school rather than right in the middle. And of course, our, our brains weren't as shaped by smartphones as most of the kids we talked to then. So it was actually trying to answer questions about what we were experiencing in conversations that started me off on the research that resulted in the book. Gotcha. It, it 
constantly boggles people's minds when I tell them that I got my first cell phone when I was in third year university. I, I don't feel like I'm that old, but I feel like the the interns that we have coming <laughs> through here who weren't even alive during 9-11 sort of thing and and just this concept of not having smartphones yeah. um, in high school, let alone university. But to, to build on that a little bit further, Jonathan, I, I'm curious, I, I've spoken to a ton of people, I'm sure that you've spoken to even more, who look at these issues in society they look around at the collapse of the nuclear family they look around at euthanasia and 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 all sorts of other issues and they look at them as though they were isolated problems they're they're things that you know yeah there's that problem in society and there's that problem but they're not connected at all it's just a matter of correlation something has happened and and set the world on fire but there's a whole bunch of different fires the the fact that the house on house is on fire they suppose is that separate fires started in a whole bunch of different uh, rooms of the house kind of thing. From your research, from the the exploration you've done into the sexual revolution, into um, basically the, the collapse of Western society throughout the 20th century sort of thing, is it is it your kind of thesis, I guess, coming that, that these are separate fires or have they been kind of woven together in... I would say a tapestry, but I think that's far too generous of a, a term. It's more of a, a spider's web that that is um, plaguing society. Are these separate issues, or are they woven together, tying back to to many of the same issues? I guess. Yeah. So it, it's kind of interesting because this this historical moment isn't a historical moment so much as something we're all still collectively living through together, which means that historians are still fighting over exactly how the sexual revolution came about. Uh, my my first year history professor told me the sexual revolution had never happened because Dr. Alfred Kinsey's Kinsey reports in 1948 and 1952 um, like revealed to all of us that everybody was sort of, you know, running like animals as a matter of course already. And then as it turns out later on, the work of Dr. Judith Reisman, who actually passed away earlier this year, exposed him for, for being a fraud, that he'd made up a lot of his data. And so things I learned in history class as recently as, you know, a decade ago or have been since exposed as, as obviously not the case. Um, same thing with, with you know, what we see, like autonomy moving from not only abortion uh, and euthanasia, which is the ultimate autonomy, I can die when I want to die. And now it's turned into, of course, transgenderism. I can be a girl, I can be a boy, um, you know, uh, even as a minor. All of these different issues, there's different scholars trying to work through how they're interconnected. So the answer is yes, they are interconnected. How they're interconnected is still being uh, worked out. Like the one book over my shelf, the, Ri- the Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by, by Carl Truman is the latest attempt to grapple at it. But even in terms of how, like what came, th- traditionally speaking, everybody was, everybody kind of believed secularism came first and the sexual revolution followed. Um, but Mary Aberstadt, uh, who I think is probably one of the most essential historians on this period, has an amazing book called How the West Really Lost God, in which she made the case that the sexual revolution broke down the family. Uh, The family is sort of the essential context in which faith flourishes. And once that broke down, secularization followed. Her case, in my view, is extremely convincing. Uh, Her latest book, which is is magnificent reading, is is called Primal Screams, How the Sexual Revolution Created Identity Politics. So she takes it all the way right to the present moment. And one of the great lines she has in that book is, is uh, she says, identity politics is the screaming bastard child of the birth control pill. Um, and there's so much truth packed into that sentence um, that I'm sure the listeners will be ruminating about it uh, for, <laughs> for hours afterwards. I'll give a couple of obvious examples of where most listeners, I think, will intuit that the sexual revolution created abortion, which is that there was this idea um, in, in the 50s, 60s, and then in the 70s, when, when the sexual revolution kind of came to fruition, that we could separate sex both from, from love and from procreation, uh, that recreational sex uh, could, could happen, that you didn't need to have any feelings for the people that you were coupling with, and that you know babies didn't need to happen. And, and this lie was believed for a couple of reasons. It was believed because contraception was becoming more widely available and more socially acceptable, And then, of course, there was the FDA's approval of of the birth control pill, which was the equivalent of a a cultural atom bomb. As all of us in the pro-life movement now know, um, these things were not particularly effective, actually, at at preventing pregnancy for a range of reasons. Um, Condoms had a 13% fail rate, and this was according to Thomas Fitch, the condom king of the CDC. Uh, The birth control pill had to be taken very consistently and 
uh, generally without alcohol and the people using it frequently, you know, screwed up or skipped the routine. And so inevitably the forces of human nature took over and the babies that people were trying to avoid having showed up anyways. And so abortion was essentially needed as, as the backup to contraception. In fact, one of the key arguments abortion activists make um, about women who are having abortion in order to normalize abortion is, well, uh, the majority of, of, of women having abortions failed con- have failed contraception. For them, that's an argument that, look, because this contraception didn't work, this is an unwanted baby, and therefore an abortion should be made available. When in reality, all they're proving is that fundamentally the whole idea that you could decouple sex and procreation was a lie, uh, that contraception didn't work, and that, that pre-born children are paying the price, which is why uh, the three of us end up uh, have ended up with the job that we've ended up with. That's that's good, and it really highlights, um, it really sort of, not highlights, but debunks the idea that um, we woke up one morning as Christians and pro-lifers, and we looked from our window, and all of a sudden we saw that the culture had changed, and it was knocking on our door, and we realized that we had to protect ourselves and kind of hide into our bubble a little bit more. But it highlights that the sexual revolution is not something that happened overnight. This is something that happened over the course of several decades um, and in many ways have taken Christians unawares. We've we've kind of been unaware of what's going on until about five years ago when we've progressed so much um, that we're just we're totally not really sure what the culture looks like anymore and, and are totally unprepared for what's coming down the pipe. Now, you mentioned I'd like to dive into the sexual revolution a little bit more if that's okay, just to give a kind of an understand, a little more of an understanding of what we're talking about. You mentioned Alfred Kinsey and Alfred Kinsey is one of those characters that so many university students hear about all the time. He's talked about in a, in a good light, like he was a good character, like his research is great uh, and so on. And yet you highlight in your book, the culture war that he's actually not so great a figure. And there's a lot of details about Alfred Kinsey that the mainstream media, that the academics don't want people to know and don't share in their classrooms. So could you talk a little bit about Alfred Kinsey and his research um, and perhaps, uh, you know, some other key figures in the sexual revolution and how it was that their work led to the changes that we see in society uh, that have that started per- perhaps in the mid 20th century, uh, but are still ongoing today? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And so I just want to lay a bit of groundwork here for listeners who really want to get get a handle on this, because I know that a bunch of the people listening to a podcast on apologetics are going to be nerds and are going to want me to lay the groundwork before I I jump into it. So I'd like to emphasize that the culture war um, was, was essentially my attempt to combine and condense in 200 pages, the basic story of how we got from, from there to here. Uh, It's not an attempt at detailing the shifts in philosophy all the way through the last couple of hundred years. If you want to read a book that, that helps you understand how, Uh, the Western mind has evolved on issues of autonomy and sexuality, then tackle a book like The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truman. What I was trying to do with the culture war, and and thankfully a lot of readers seem to think it succeeded, is to basically tell the story of what happened chronologically, tell it through the stories of people in a way that's easy to understand. So when we're talking about Alfred Kinsey and Margaret Mead, which are two of the key figures that I bring up, in my first chapter um, on the sexual revolution uh, in the culture war is Margaret Mead, who I refer to as the mother of the sexual revolution, and Alfred Kinsey, the father of the sexual revolution. So for the apologetics nerds, obviously the philosophical frameworks they were working with started earlier. The story could be much longer and more complete. For the purposes of giving people an easy historical understanding of what happened, I think it's, it's historically fair to pinpoint those two figures as laying the groundwork, especially in the North American context. And the North American context, uh, it, with the story of the sexual revolution, exported all the way around the world. So uh, Margaret Mead's book, uh, in coming, The Coming of Agents in Samoa, published in 1928, is still considered to be a seminal anthropological work, even though uh, most of the facts contained therein have, have long since been debunked by someone who actually visited uh, Samoa several decades after she went uh, to try and, and do follow-up research on her book, which told the story of, of a very romantic South Seas hookup culture where people more or less lived uh, exactly as they wanted to, where young people were encouraged in, in sexual experimentation, where egalitarianism was the norm in most matters. And uh, 
when Freeman got to Samoa to do his follow-up research, as, as researchers ought to do, he discovered that this was not a thing uh, that actually happened in Samoa. That was, in fact, quite a strict culture that, like most cultures in the world, it strictly policed sexuality in one way or another. Uh, and that, in fact, most of, the da- most of the information contained in Margaret Mead's book was the result of the fact that instead of living with a family, learning the language, and doing sort of the really heavy lifting, she had instead befriended two Samoan girls, asked them about their experiences, uh, and then shared those experiences with the world in a way that proved to be incredibly transformative. You know, the Scientific American credits that book with helping to start the sexual revolution, lay the groundwork that dispelled the idea of natural law, that started everybody thinking about maybe there's ways that we could live that are better for us. And she says this explicitly, that in in Polynesia, she found a better way to live, which is to say a sexually liberated way to live, except for the fact that as it turned out, uh, one of the Polynesian customs that she was unaware of, not having done very good research, was that it was incredibly rude to ask people personal and intimate questions of that sort. And uh, to pay her back for being so rude, the two Samoan girls she had befriended had actually told her a series of tall tales uh, about their 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 uh, vibrant sex lives that Western culture is still bearing the consequences from. That whole story is contained in, in the first chapter of The Culture War. Uh, I've published that online. We'll link that in the show notes, but I'm going to keep it brief for the sake of time. The father of the sexual revolution, Alfred Kinsey, uh, who you mentioned, uh, Peter, and you're precisely right. He's considered to be a sort of a titan now. Um, by the the intellectuals of the sexual revolution. In fact, they did a biopic of him a couple of years ago with uh, Liam Neeson starring as Alfred Kinsey. And Alfred Kinsey was a, was a zoologist who specialized in, in, in gull wasps. And if he'd stuck to that, we'd all be a, a lot better off today. Uh, and he decided to instead branch into the new field of, of so-called sexology, um, where he basically uh, put together a team, including men like uh, War Pomeroy, and they interviewed thousands of Americans on their sex lives. And then he published his findings in two books, uh, Sexual Behavior on the Human Male and Sexual Behavior on the Human Female. And those reports uh, were unbelievably destructive and influential because in those reports, uh, what ended up happening is Kinsey discovered uh, that the men and women of the uh, World War II greatest generation who survived the Depression and freed the world from tyranny uh, were, in fact, actually um, almost universally cheating on their wives uh, using prostitutes, um, uh, the 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 number that ten percent of people uh, identify as, as as gay or bisexual comes from Kinsey's reports. Even today, when we're as about as liberated as you can get on that issue, the number still isn't anywhere close to ten percent in twenty twenty one. He said it was around ten percent back in nineteen forty eight. Um, he you know talked about the rates of bestiality, which he said would go up in relation to to being on a farm, and basically. Uh, the impact of his work was so significant because he said, look, over 90% of Americans are actually sex criminals based on how the law is written and interpreted today. And so because nobody's listening to these laws, because everybody's living this way, we might as well get rid of them. And he kind of portrayed himself as a moderate middle-class Republican, you know, in a boring heterosexual marriage, uh, and that he didn't have any skin in the game. Um, probably, I probably shouldn't put it that way. Um, but he, in fact, very much did. He was keeping both male and female staff members. Um, he 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 basically made up a lot of the data uh, that 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 didn't fit with his thesis. They they reclassified uh, prostitutes as Susie Homemaker. Um, they interviewed uh, sex criminals in prisons and reclassified them as average people. Uh, he spent a lot of his time doing interviews in, in in gay bars in New York City and things like that, and again presented this as 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 representative uh, information. And in the most chilling and horrifying aspect of the Kinsey reports, which I'm sure any any of our listeners can get this book from the public library and check it out for themselves. I have. You can find his his table on on the data on child sexuality, um, which is the basis of 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 most Western nations believing sex education needs to begin in you know preschool or kindergarten. Uh, It was he basically was the one who really started to push with his junk data the idea that children are sexual from birth. And it's because he used data from from pedophiles who were actually abusing children and recording those reactions as sexual responses rather than than fear or pain. I won't get into too much detail on that, but uh, suffice it to say that um, the things he did to children 
or facilitated uh, were horrifying. And again, I've, I've written an article on this that we can link in the show notes as well if anybody's actually interested in diving into that particular gutter. Uh, it is really disturbing stuff. But these two people, Margaret Mead, essentially revealed to the intellectual world that there was a better way to live, uh, that people could actually abandon the uh, monogamy, abandon the traditional family structure and be happier and healthier, which dealt a huge blow to the, the fundamental thesis of natural law, which is that there is a created order and living in harmony with that created order is the best way to live. And then uh, Dr. Alfred Kinsey came out and basically said, look, guys, everybody's uh, everybody's been living like that between the sheets already anyways. It's time for the law to catch up. Um, and then uh, the man the man who dubbed himself Kinsey's pamphleteers or pamphleteer, pardon me, and, and, and sought to popularize, popularize his ideas was a man named Hugh Hefner, which, of course, is he is now known to the world as the pajama founder of Playboy magazine, who came out with the first porno mag in 1953 with the centerfold depicting Marilyn Monroe. And uh, he actually came from a pretty strict uh, Christian family and, and claimed to be descended directly from the Puritan William Bradford on Plymouth Rock. But once he read uh, um, Alfred Kinsey's uh, studies, he started up a new uh, and, and, and sort of hedonistic magazine. He got a divorce uh, from his wife, which was a lifelong habit he maintained all the way uh, until his death, and, and began working on a magazine that, along with Cosmo and a few other magazines, started to sell a very specific philosophy, uh, the Playboy philosophy, the Cosmo philosophy. And so we see how these intellectuals basically rocked the intellectual world, um, sent reverberations throughout the culture, and created acolytes in the media that began the long, hard, uh, decades worth of work that has resulted in the culture we live in today. That's the short version. And and I mean, I, I have so much appreciation for you, Jonathan, the guy that that swims through tragically all of these gutters of of doing the research on all this <laughs> stuff and, and packaging it into a, a great book like The Culture <laughs> War so that guys like me don't necessarily need to read all the filth that, that you um, wade your way through to to get an understanding. Yeah, that's this. not great stuff. Not, not a great job. Not not the most appealing of jobs. Not super glamorous. And it it makes me think of quote often attributed to Sir Winston Churchill of a lie can get halfway around the world before the truth even gets a chance to put its pants on sort of thing. This is something that we we hear even today at, at high schools, right? I mean, we, we talk to high school guys, high school girls who tell us that everybody in their grade is having sex with whomever they want. And it's just like, it, it's impossible for an adolescent. It's impossible for a teenager to get through high school, let alone, mm -hmm. let alone university without having sex with multiple different partners um, and experimenting with all sorts of different relationships. Peter, you and I have, have talked on the program about the idea that ideas have consequences and bad ideas have victims sort of thing. Jonathan, maybe, maybe let's speak to, you, you mentioned Hugh Hefner, you mentioned the, the implications of these quote unquote academic papers and whatnot. Let's talk about the collateral damage that has come from these ideas, these, these papers that have been published. Let's talk about the breakdown of the family through now the, the 50s, 60s, 70s kind of thing and mm -hmm. how, what we've seen with the sex revolution and the, the demand for abortion and whatnot, what have you seen in your research with regards to the development from one to the other? Obviously, there's, there's a lot of statistics around the, the growing response and, and obviously the uptake from Hugh Hefner and others in, um, okay, well, I guess if, if everyone else is doing it, then All Star Doing it becomes this positive feedback loop. What have you seen or what, what have you found from your research in these ideas actually becoming reality, though they weren't reality before, I guess? Well, I'll start by, by sort of pointing the listeners back to previous episodes of your show. One of the things I found is, is precisely the same things that you and Peter have found, it's impossible to go out into the street to have a conversation with anybody today in our post-revolutionary world at a high school, on a campus, or anywhere without actually um, ending, being confronted by the impact of the sexual revolution, right? That's why you guys have talked about hard apologetics and context and figuring out where people are coming from. It's because the sheer amount of pain people have experienced because their families have been blown apart, because they've been mistreated by men, because sexual assault and sexual violence has become so much more common, because the sexual revolution taught everyone that people could be things and things can be used. Um, and so I think that anybody who is a pro-life activist, you know, experiences and encounters the impact of the sexual revolution 
uh, on pretty much on a daily basis. And that's why I think it's important for people to, to understand what the sexual revolution is, because it's context. It's the context in which we operate as pro-life activists, which is why it's not like you're going to use a lot of this information that we're talking about on the show, you know, out on the street having a conversation about abortion. But knowing what we're talking about on this show will help you understand why you're having this conversation about abortion in the first place. And so with that, with that bit of context, it's really difficult to, to actually lay out the full cost of the sexual revolution because it's still unfolding. In the book, I go through a number of different things. I, I, we talk about the pandemic of, of sexually transmitted diseases and sexually transmitted infections, um, which is, is, is if you look at the uh, Stats Canada website uh, in Canada or, or the Center for Disease Control in the United States, the, the numbers of, of, of kids, too, who have a sexually transmitted disease it's just mind boggling. And it's never something that will be discussed because in our culture, you can't have an honest discussion about anything uh, that reflects badly on sexual freedom. Um, so at the end of the day, yeah, we like not giving an opinion on COVID-19 right now, but we can lock down all of society for one virus, but we can't tell kids to keep it in their pants for 15 minutes longer uh, when we're seeing pandemic rates of sexually transmitted infections that are already having a devastating impact on people's lives on the reproductive capacity. I, and again, I include these numbers in the book and you can find them on the, on the Stats Canada website um, or, or the Center for Disease Control. You'll have to read government numbers because there's almost no reporting on this. I think the only major media organization I've seen report on STD numbers in the last decade in Canada is the National Post, which did write one very uh, good column looking at those numbers. So you, you, first you see sort of the, the pandemic numbers of STDs and STIs. Um, for which apparently there is no solution because we can't possibly tell kids not to engage in a behavior uh, that can result in this illness. Um, so yeah, I, I have a fair, a fairly bitter feelings about about that, and especially in the context of our of our current cultural moment. Then, of course, we have uh, the reality of abortion. Um, abortion being the failsafe for those who want to, you know, engage in the act of procreation without procreating and ensuring that if procreation takes place, uh, the child that results um, ends up dead or certainly not uh, in, in their lives. And so in the, in the U.S., we're talking about over 65 million babies. In Canada, we're talking about well over 4 million babies. And that's a real intangible cost that often gets ignored because the bodies um, aren't laying around for people to see. Right. I think that anybody who's actually seen an, an aborted baby face to face has held an aborted baby's body in their hands, as I have in the past, has a much more real sense of, of, of what the sexual revolution was all about. Everybody's heard of the French Revolution or the American Revolution. Uh, most people, I think, who are familiar with these stories have a basic understanding of the human cost of these revolutions. But people act like the sexual revolution was a bloodless revolution, was a revolution in which nobody died. In reality, the sexual revolution is the most successful and the most bloody revolution in all of human history with a higher kill count than anything we've seen uh, in, in a couple of thousand years. So I think that's important to point out. You know, the slogans of the 60s and 70s were make love, not war. Uh, and they very, very much did, did, did both. Um, the anti-war protesters in many cases wouldn't have found something they were willing to die for, but there was certainly something they were willing to kill for. And that was uh, liberated sex, liberated from responsibility, liberated from consequences, and liberated as we're seeing now from human nature itself, which is really the key to all of this, is that if we believe there is a natural order, and yet we choose to live in ways that defy that natural order, um, I think any, any scientist would have to agree with the term natural order. Um, a Christian would say a created order. Either way, they mean more or less the same thing. Uh, and so we've also seen, of course, um, family blown apart. It's, it's so interesting to me, and I don't know what you guys think of this, but on the streets you so often hear about me, 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 especially in terms of marriage, right? Like, you know, I need to be happy and therefore I have to leave this marriage. And, you know, uh, screw it if there's a whole bunch of kids involved who might actually need you to stay together for them. Um, I, I, I've talked so many times to delusional people who say, my kids would want me to be happy. No, your kids want you to, to stay together and provide them a, a parental home, right? They don't have any, uh, and, and happiness is something that comes and goes, commitment to something that shouldn't. And so, but really one of the things I think that strikes me the most uh, in terms of how the sexual revolution has blown apart families, has resulted in an enormous amount of carnage, is, is this idea that we have somehow made a virtue out of being selfish, um, right? Some of you guys have probably seen this valedictorian speech uh, from a chick in Texas that just went viral, where she's talking about how she needs abortion because I have ambitions, I have dreams, 
I was like, when did it become so admirable and click worthy and viral to say like, I'll do whatever it takes to make sure I get what I want, regardless of who else has to pay the consequences for it, right? Whether or not you think somebody should have the right to do it, it's this idea that it's somehow virtuous um, to put yourself first all the time is I think probably one of the most basic poisonous aspects of the sexual revolution, like avoiding philosophy and just pinpointing here something that all of our listeners will be able to see and identify in the culture around them. That's one that's really struck me. Gotcha. And and to follow up on that, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot here in just a moment for a couple of kind of conversational anecdotes that you've had with people on on street corners and on doorsteps. But I I think mm-hmm. about, so so going from kind of the the high level not actually abstract, but just the millions of children who've been killed. I, I think often of a quote that you shared with me actually from, from Dr. Monica Miller about um, the, the carnage of the sexual revolution of where do you put 65 million bodies kind of thing. But bringing it from that into yeah. the personal kind of experience that, that people have, obviously the, the killed victims of abortion, the preborn children are the primary victims. And yet the three of us here and, and Jonathan, I'm sure that you've seen it on, on countless occasions, seeing the brokenness of those individual people where this is no longer an abstract idea. There's no longer a theoretical thing. They had an abortion five years ago, five weeks ago, five days ago. Um, and seeing the aftermath of the sexual revolution played out in their lives. I, I'd be curious about from somebody who's done all of this background research and seen all of these major moving pieces, but has also seen a lot of the very, very individual people who have been the collateral damage, who have bought into this lie of the sexual revolution and are now paying the price for it. What has your experience been? And and maybe if you've got an anecdote or two of people whose experiences have stood out in your memory from your time in the pro-life movement, I guess. Hmm. That's a great, that's a really great question. And it's actually hard to pick one because as I mentioned earlier in the conversation, um, it was conversations like, like what you're referring to that actually uh, like kind of triggered me to do the research in the first place. Uh, one that really struck me um, was I remember talking to a girl outside of high school in, in Brampton, which is in the greater Toronto area. And we were having this conversation about abortion and like she was tracking with me on like human rights and, you know, the scientific reality of, of who the preborn are and abortion was horrible, but like there was something that was like not clicking. Like she, there was, there was this barrier. So I thought, well, you know, you're going to need hard apologetics, switch tracks, find out what the personal barrier to accepting this position is. And like what she said actually really struck me because she said, well, if, if I get pregnant, I can't do it by myself. And so I need abortion to be legal. And the reason this struck me was twofold. First of all, it was at that point that I'd realized in like a series of a dozen conversations, pretty much every girl had said, I can't do it by myself, as if it was a foregone conclusion that the guy wasn't going to be around. Um, so like, you know, it takes two to tango. Every baby has a mother and a father. But the girls I was conversing with, and I know I've talked to both of you guys about this before, this is a common experience. They spoke as if those children had no fathers. Um and, and like, yeah, like, yeah, look, look, like our work taught us there was lots of piece of garbage men, but the idea that it was just generally accepted that none of them would be around and there was no expectation that they would, like, it's like the guys aren't even expected to stick around. That's how little faith girls have in guys now. Um, and, and then when she said that, I, I said to her, like, like it just kind of blurted it out because we usually don't talk about, um, you know, chastity on, on the streets, although it's you know, happened quite a bit on campus, I find by accident. I said to her, I'm like, what if you waited to have sex and, and until you had sex with somebody who wanted to have a baby with you or would take care of the baby? And she stopped and she looked all wistful and she said, like, yeah, wow, eh? That would be, that would be like, that would be amazing. And, I, and that one was when I realized I used the term post revolutionary earlier. And the reason I used that term was because, like, Mary Aberstadt, again, one of the most essential historians of the sexual revolution, has often pointed out that where we are right now, um, and, and we're all pretty old at this point, um, the sexual revolution is we're now talking about, you know, starting in the, in, in, the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And she points it out that at this point, we're, we're approaching the era where nobody who remembers what life was like before the revolution will exist. And so we, we were, not, were not confronting legions of young people 
who have rejected the traditional, you know, Judeo-Christian positions on sexuality. These are people who have never heard them, right? These people who have grown up with TV shows and it more or less reflects their lives. It's people who have not been brought up with any system of morals. They've been brought up to believe that the only sin is judging somebody for their actions. They've been brought up to believe that if it feels good, do it. They've been brought up to believe that there's not much of a distinction between pleasure and happiness. They've been brought up to believe that they should be able to do whatever it is that they want to do because there's no moral distinction between monogamy and promiscuity, for example. And so when I suggested this to her, this is the first time anybody had suggested that she didn't have to have sex in high school or in university. She could be completely free to wait. I've often thought that one of the... It's, it's so bizarre because these days everything has to be a sexual identity, you know, on its own with specific recognition and I'm sure a flag any day now. But you'll notice now that in the um, expanding alphabet soup acronym, um, asexual is in there. And sometimes I think it's just a lot of these like sexually exhausted people. If you hear the interviews of them, they just don't want in. They want out of hookup culture. They want off of Tinder. They don't want to be on the merry-go-round anymore. Um, so they're like, they call themselves asexual. And I'm sometimes like, some of these people might just be so sick of the toxic sexual culture they've grown up in um, that they're opting out. But there's another way, there is another way to live, one that involves commitment, one that involves um, a commitment to any child you might conceive with somebody, right? There's, But that way of life is becoming so distant to so many people uh, that there are people who don't actually know Um, that there's a better way to live. So that one struck me the most for those two things. One, the realization that she didn't actually know there was a better way to live her life. And two, this is assumption the guy guy wouldn't stick around. The one other one um, that I know you guys have had similar conversations um, like this one was the guy that I I talked to for like an hour. I forget which campus this was on. I can picture the campus, but I don't remember the name. Um, There was too many that month. Anyways, we were talking about uh, abortion and, you know, 20 minutes in, he kind of agreed with me. Yeah, yeah, no, abortion's wrong. And and then so we worked through all the different circumstances and we finally had him down on all the circumstances. And then and then he said, what about the morning after pill? So we went through the morning after pill and how that's an abortifacient. And he said, well, thank goodness we have the birth control pill. I'm like, well, I got some bad news for you. Um, there, are, there are quite a few forms of hormonal birth control too that, act, that potentially act as an abortifacient. And so considering the fact we're talking about human life, we should be super careful. Um, and then he was sitting there looking at me. He's like, was this whole conversation just to trick me into not having sex until I'm married to keep my kids safe? <laughs> it's like, no, it wasn't. But it's really interesting that you got there by yourself, right? Like that you basically reached that conclusion sort of on your own. Um, later on, I saw him shoveling condoms into his backpack at the Planned Parenthood table. So I obviously didn't make it quite clear enough. But we whittled down his options so far that he kind of realized, wait a second, if if I'm going to ensure that my offspring are safe, I actually just just should probably regulate my sexual activity, which, you know, didn't used to be such a radical idea. But as all of your listeners will know, if you really want to piss everyone off, bring that up. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and one of the reasons for that is the rise of porn. I mean, you talked about Hugh Hefner and you talked about how he started with a magazine. But as we know, that magazine has turned into to videos, which are watched an astronomical amount of times every year um, and really has made every single person a player in the sexual revolution. I mean, most people within or without of the, the church or Christian communities are involved in porn in some way. They've watched it in the past. They're currently watching it now um, or are heavily addicted to it. So I'd like to talk about porn a little bit because porn is very, very closely tied to abortion, uh, pro-life work uh, and all of that. And while women certainly watch porn, uh, while the the numbers of women rising porn, uh, watching porn are rising. I want to talk about men and porn for a minute. That that guy that you had a conversation with certainly was an anomaly, I I would imagine, uh, in the conversations that we have with men. I've had far more conversations on university campus campuses where the guy refuses to accept the pro-life position for the reason that he just wants to have sex whenever he wants. Um, and, uh, and part of that, I mean, one of the reasons for that is porn has taught people that, as you mentioned a little bit earlier, that it, it sort of frees sex from consequences, that we can have sex, that we can engage in sexual intercourse, that we can enjoy sex, whether it be on the screen or with someone else, and have no responsibility for um, the children that come from that, those inconvenient uh, you know, results of, of, of having sex, we just, you know, drop our, our girl off to the abortion clinic and we rid of, rid ourselves of those inconveniences that we can go on and live as we want. So let's talk about men and porn and abortion for a minute, perhaps talk about 
how the sexual revolution, specifically porn, has trained men uh, in many ways or kind of given them fertile ground to be this selfish creature that we see today. And talk about men within the pro-life movement. How does how does porn affect whether men work in the pro-life movement or not or how they sort of function within fighting abortion and, and seeking justice for the most vulnerable? Yeah, no, this is a, this is a, a great question and I, and I like your framing of it. Uh, just to, to start with the, the brief historical synopsis, yeah, we've got Hugh Kefner, um, Hugh Kefner's magazine and the success thereof spawns a whole bunch of other magazines that compete with him, um, Screw, Hustler, Penthouse. Uh, it's, it gets cruder. It gets uglier. Um, it, um, they, they abandon Hugh Hefner's pretense that there's such a thing as a playboy philosophy other than lust, because, of course, he tried to hire, you know, literary figures like Margaret Atwood to write for Playboy, which, um, yeah, so the author of A Handmaid's Tale was also writing for for a key organ of, of the sexual revolution. But where where pornography really conquered the culture, because I think it's important to realize, actually, that obscenity laws um, and, and, and and sort of like anti lewdness task force were doing a pretty good job in the 80s of pushing back. And where we lost was the Internet. So first, um, you know, when the Internet started, you know, pornographers started going online and huge numbers of people started to view pornography there. Where it went from, wow, this problem is, is, is sort of sweeping through the culture to, as you put it, Peter, everybody's involved in some way, is when the smartphone uh, was, was capable of, of actually um, streaming porn at a rate that it was just as good as, as on, your, uh, on your laptop, right? That's why I say like, like myself and like Cam, we kind of straddle those two generations. Cause like we had internet in the house, but we had like the dial up that like was like, what on, what on. And like, it was like ridiculously patchy and you know, like I'm sure you could, you could have found porn if you tried really hard, but it was like pretty difficult. Um, and like my first phones, like couldn't, I couldn't have looked at porn on those phones, but if, if I'd wanted to, if I'd wanted to, right. I would have spent like 30 minutes waiting for a picture to load and videos were out of the question. Uh, but in 2006, or seven, sorry, 2007 was the, the, I graduated from high school in 2006. 2007 was the first iPhone. And that was really the advent uh, of, of the smartphone and everybody carrying the sexual revolution in their pocket. And, and, and that's why um, almost everybody was afforded the opportunity to look at porn. Whereas before, even though the internet had spread it quite effectively, uh, there was there was absolutely no way a lot of people could get a hold of it and then we ended up in a situation where not only could everybody get a hold of it, but um, parents seem to believe that these these dangerous devices are somehow essential because why not give your kids the means to screw their lives up before their brains are developed? And so now we see that, that pornography went to a problem that some in the church struggled with to, to a problem I think the church collectively struggles with. I more or less assume somebody's dabbled in or is consistently watching porn um, unless they've told me otherwise. And usually this ends up being the case. So to start off with, Peter, I want to um, retweet your point there about how pornography also sort of separated sex from procreation uh, and sort of helped entrench the idea that the, the contraceptive mentality had already had already um, sort of pioneered in the frontal lobes of men everywhere. Then, of course, you have the idea that, that pornography transformed people's views of sexually, sexuality more fundamentally, um, which is to say that sex was fantasy. And children, uh, as all three of us on this call know, um, are have a way of bringing you down to reality fairly abruptly. And so, pornography pornography is an ideology of sex as much as it is anything else. Um, it has nothing to do with commitment. It has nothing to do with tenderness. It has nothing to do, um, well, really, with anything other than than getting your sexual high. It's about novelty. It's about taking. It's about using. And increasingly, over the last five to ten years. It's become about sexual violence, which, as one major porn producer said, is the future of American porn. Uh, and around the world, most people are watching porn produced in the United States. And so porn has really uh, taken the sexual revolution, made everybody a collaborator in some ways, and then metastasized it. It's turned it into something that nobody could ignore and more or less defeated the, the Christian strategy of withdrawing you know, to, to communities in which uh, morals and behaviors could be could sort of be policed for lack of a better word, um, once once everybody was carrying the porn industry in, in their pocket or their purse, it became essentially Im impossible to do this. Uh, and it crudened and coarsened absolutely everything. So pornography has been, been tremendously destructive. And in terms of its immediate impact on, on the pro-life movement, 
I know all of us and many of the listeners as well, I'm sure, have seen that that sign, you know, um, 77% of, of, of anti-abortion leaders are men, 100% of them can't get pregnant. Or, you know, the pro-life movement's a movement full uh, filled with like old white men. I wish we had a few more of those, uh, to be honest, because my experience, the reason the, the reason a podcast called The Pro-Life Guys is such a novelty is because there's so few of them. Um, there's so few guys who are willing to commit to, to, to work in the pro-life movement. Our internship here in Ontario that both me and Peter are working with has, has one dude and a whole bunch of girls. And that's normal. Um, one of our earlier internships, we had no male applicants at all. We had like phone around and ask uh, for a guy because we wanted to ensure that the females had protection from the pro-abortion guys uh, on the streets. Um, pro-abortion guys uh, notorious for, for, for treating women like garbage and, and very frequently do. And so we have found it very hard to get men to, to commit to doing this and I remember I didn't really figure out what it was for a while. I thought it was like the basic stuff because there's other reasons, right? The pro-life movement does not pay what you get at an ordinary job. A lot of people don't like getting yelled at. People don't like engaging with controversy. So there's all the normal reasons that anybody of either gender might hesitate um, about getting involved in the pro-life movement. And then I actually started asking. I remember the guy it was too. I'm obviously not going to say who it was, but I remember who it was. It was a person who was very convicted about abortion, very convicted to join the pro-life movement. And was just like dragging, dragging his feet and really, really suddenly reluctant. And finally, I remember asking him, how long have you struggled with porn? And bingo. Yeah, like seven years, I think it was. And then I started asking, I started asking like all these guys, like, so like how long have you struggled with porn? All of them. I mean, like not a single one of them was like, no, 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 I never struggled. That's not my issue. And it turns out that like no guy like looks at porn, closes his laptop or turns his phone off and thinks that was time well spent, right? No, they feel awful. They feel ashamed. They feel hypocritical. And the idea of taking a public stand for women and children while participating in the victimization of, of, of women in their private time was, was the sort of dissonance that many of them couldn't handle. And so instead, they just decided not to get involved. If you look at the, uh, the stats on pastors and priests, who are involved in porn use. It's not just the pro-life movement. I would argue that every major ministry is being robbed of men that they desperately need by the use of, of pornography. Uh, our, our mutual friend, Josh Gilman, um, who runs the anti-porn organization here in Canada, Strength to Fight, once made a joke when we were at an apologetics conference in Calgary and I was manning the table next to his. He said, let's just tag team this. You ask the guy if they're interested in getting involved in pro-life work. And if he says no, I'll just duck in and say, hey, let me help you with your porn problem. Um, and that's, that's how common it is now for, for porn to be porn, porn to be one of the major reasons men aren't participating in this movement. Because to be honest, guys, like people have often said, oh man, like this movement is it's so crazy. Um, why would you want to join the pro-life movement? I've often said the pro-life movement has given me far more than I've ever given it. Um, like it, 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 it feels genuinely fulfilling as a man to be able to fight for the weak and the vulnerable. It's an honor to be able to. Uh, to stand up for women and children. It's unbelievable when you get to find out that a baby's been saved for abortion. What guy wouldn't want to do something like this, right? What guy wouldn't want to realize that, you know, we went out there and, and, and we fought some dragons and we won. And by the way, like here's a picture of the baby that would have been killed if we hadn't been out there, right? So I think the pro-life movement is the perfect movement for men. And one of the reasons that so few of them join it is because they're looking at porn. Yeah, that's 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 certainly true. And uh, I don't have the stats on, on with me right now, but the amount of men looking at porn is absolutely staggering. Um, but if you're listening to this, you're a guy, you're watching porn, you know, be free from it. There are so many resources and then join us in the streets uh, as we fight abortion. Jonathan, there's so much we could say about the, the, the sexual revolution and the current cultural moment and how we got here. Uh, you write about that a lot in your book, The Culture War. You talked about the rise and triumph of the modern self by Carl Truman, which talks about the philosophy and some of the key figures behind the sort of culture that we are in today. Um, but before we get to sort of what advice you have for people and where we go from here as Christians, as pro-lifers, as people who still want to make a difference and be active in the culture, I do have a question for you. So we see abortion, and I think you've made it clear that abortion is a sort of a symptom of a larger problem. It's a symptom of the sexual mm -hmm. revolution, which gave us so much evil. Um, and, uh, and abortion kind of is the, the necessary result, as it were, of the sexual revolution, uh, because we need to get rid of these children because we're using our reproductive organs and they happen to not be recreational organs like we wish they were. But wouldn't 
fighting abortion just be fighting a symptom rather than the real problem, like the root? Um, shouldn't we focus more on the sexual revolution or perhaps even going further back? Shouldn't we focus more on just people having faith in Jesus and trans having their lives transformed and their worldviews changed uh, so that they make good decisions in the future? Or why should we be active in the, the fight for abortion today? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because um, there's a really easy answer to that question. And then there's there's the complicated one. The very easy uh, answer to that question is, is abortion is an emergency. Uh, there are going to be 300 babies that die tomorrow if we don't do something about it here in Canada. 3,000 uh, or somewhere around that number in the United States. And unless uh, pro-lifers follow Jesus' commands to love our neighbor as ourself and follow the command in Proverbs to rescue those um, you know, that are stumbling to the slaughter, rescuing those that are, are being drawn unto death, they will die. And so there is a difference between um, a moral issue and an issue of injustice. Uh, abortion is obviously both immoral and an unjust, uh, but not, not, not everything is in the same category. So, so there are plenty of, of sex acts, for example, that I, as a Christian, would consider to be immoral, um, but aren't on injustice, although there are plenty that are as well. Um, with abortion, we're talking about something that's both immoral and unjust. We are, it's, it's, a, it's a human being creating God's image being murdered. And those children need somebody to intervene for them right now. Um, I remember Greg Cunningham once saying, the gospel is irrelevant to a baby cooling in a dumpster. And so on one hand, yes, absolutely, evangelization is essential. But we're not saying that the pro-life movement precludes that. We're saying we're, we are engaged right now in a rescue mission. We are responding to an emergency. But what we actually need to confront the sexual revolution is a wide range of things. So you mentioned earlier, Peter, that guys, if you're looking at porn, you need to stop. So anybody, guy or girl, who's looking at pornography and listening to this, go to covenanteyes.com, get yourself a filter, get yourself accountable. The first thing that you can do to fight the sexual revolution is to ensure that you're combating its influences in your own life. And again, uh, at this point, the sexual revolution is the culture. Um, our culture used to be based on revelation. Now it's based on revolution. And at the end of the day, what we actually have to do uh, is is opt out. So a lot of people think, well, like I'm not engaging in anything intentionally. Like, no, the entertainment, the music, you name it, all of it's now influenced by this revolution that's more or less conquered culture. And we have to opt out uh, of that culture. So personally speaking, stop looking at porn and talk to your friends and like the people that you know who will who only talk to you that you're close to. Ask them if they struggle, help them if they do. Um, you'll find out that people that you know and love very much that you're very close to have been struggling and they'll probably be incredibly relieved that you talk to them. Um, and many of them will welcome the opportunity to get help. That's certainly been uh, my experience. Then of course, uh, we already mentioned evangelization, which is obviously essential uh, because from the Christian perspective, um, the only solution to the sexual revolution is, is forgiveness um, through Christ. So that, that's the fundamental bedrock institution. But what we're talking about then, culturally speaking, is revival. Um, that, of course, is, it can only be or orchestrated by God in his providence or in his time and, and can't necessarily um, be orchestrated by, by human beings. In terms of, of practically understanding the sexual revolution, I think we need to understand the culture that we live in. Very few people understand how this happened because a lot of Christian families were just living their lives and ignoring these things, right? They weren't at, you know, the the bra burning protests and the abortion marches, and they weren't part of all of these movements. In many cases, uh, they were too busy, you know, raising kids uh, and doing the sorts of things that people just did, you know, for the last hundreds of years while the culture transformed around them. So abortion is an emergency. There are many immoralities as well that need to be addressed, and many of those are soul issues and heart issues, and are not issues that can be combated, quite frankly, by, by a movement. Um, you know, like a, a movement, a movement to confront injustice. The, the pro-life movement is like the civil rights movement. It's like the abolitionist movement. It's like the movement to, to, to save uh, Jews during the Holocaust. Um, you couldn't, you wouldn't have a similar movement against fornication or something like that. that that's something that has to be addressed personally. It has to be addressed in churches. It has to be addressed in, in broader communities. Um, but there's a huge distinction between injustice and immorality, even though an injustice is always both. Totally, totally. And, and I think that's so good for people to, to be able to wrap their heads around it and, and those concrete steps for how we start responding to this culture. Right? I think that for a lot of Christians, they look at this as we talked about at the beginning, and, and it's just there are so many dragons that need to be slayed, um, not only in our own lives, but in, in culture and in the lives of people that we love and, and deeply care about. And 
that's where we need to start, right? We need to get out there. We need to certainly address the the challenges, struggles, problems that we have in our own lives, and then have the courage to start going out on, whether it's street corners and on doorsteps like we do at CCBR, whether it's conversations with your kids, with your siblings, with your parents, whomever they may be, we absolutely um, need to... We need, we need more more knights in shining armor, as it were. I, I, I love that metaphor. I don't remember which in, intern it was that talked about that. We need more knights in shining armor. And tragically, your armor is not going to stay super shiny in this culture where there's a lot of mudslinging that goes on. But that is absolutely what we need. More people who are willing to take up the fight and do what they can. And, and at the end of the day, it's not up to you as an individual to... Um, lead and and succeed in the counter-revolution right this this is something that we are tools in the lord's hands and and we are called to be faithful we are called to be effective and and ultimately do what we can through the grace and, and guidance of god in in transforming the individual practical lives i think it's so valuable that that we talk both on the, mm-hmm. the higher level and on the lower level is there any kind of last advice that you would give to somebody who's listening, who says, okay, what is, what is the next step that I do? You talked about quitting porn. Obviously that, that should be the first step. Hopefully that started last night of the first step. If, if last night was your last time, then great. Whatever, whatever your last time, make that the actual last time. What is, what is a concrete step for advice for how you can get involved in ending abortion? Bring it back to abortion at the end here. What would you suggest for how somebody gets off of the the bleachers and into the the stadium, as it were, for actually contributing towards transforming the culture? If if you're listening to this podcast, I think the answer is quite easy. Because if you're in Canada, you can get involved uh, with CCBR. If you're interested in in political work on the pro-life front, no matter what you're interested in, get in touch with the pro-life guys. They'll connect you with 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 the right people. Same thing with the U.S., where we obviously know our partners in in, in all sorts of different countries. So please just do get in touch with us so we can we can help you um, help connect you with with the best pro-life opportunities uh, where you live or getting something started on your own if something doesn't exist. One of the stories I, I would encourage people to to consider that's that's I think um, I, I, I I get sick of the word inspiring, so I'll say motivating. Um, is is the story of William Wilberforce, who's known as an abolitionist primarily, right, uh, as, as, as the key spokesperson for the Society for Affecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade, which began in 1787. However, he, he actually, his famous mission statement that literally transformed the world as we know it was the abolition of the slave trade and the reformation of manners. Right. He started so many different organizations. He fought so many different causes from the very first SPCA, uh, confronting um, the cruelty uh, uh, on treatment of animals to, to education for kids. He funded Sunday schools, you name it, and he was involved in it. So nobody's saying that if you join the pro-life movement, you should ignore all of these other issues because you can walk and chew go at the same time, right? You can be volunteering for CCBR or another great pro-life group. And also um, you can be walking with your friends who are struggling with porn and helping uh, to get them free. You can be working with your with your church or a Christian organization on their mission outreach or their evangelization, right? In fact, I would argue that most of these things, um, we should be doing all of them. Um, they should all be part of your life uh, in, in one way or another. So there's no reason to, to sort of politicize your contribution to the culture as a Christian living a Christian life. Um, but I would just suggest that because the, uh, the, the pro-life issue is an emergency rather than a cause, it's an emergency rather than simply a moral issue, and it's the one issue in which babies will die if people like yourself don't intervene. Uh, that this is this issue um, should be seen as something that we need to address if we are to fully obey um, um, Christ's command to love our neighbor as ourselves. Because if we are called to help those who are being drawn unto death, those who are stumbling unto slaughter, I don't know if you guys can think of any better example of people in Canada who are literally appointed to slaughter other than preborn babies scheduled for abortion. Um, I can't. There have been historic injustices, but right now, this is the injustice. And every um, every era has injustices that men are called upon to combat. And I think that too many men today um, are too busy looking at porn on their smartphones and binging on Netflix uh, to get off their rears and do what they're supposed to. So hopefully they'll be motivated to, to t- take the tentacles of the sexual revolution and cut them off and get rid of them and then, and then join this particular fight. And um, you guys, myself, anybody um, that they're willing to connect with would be happy to, to get you uh, connected with whatever pro-life group um, strikes your interest. 
Absolutely. Yeah, that's what we do. That's what we that's what we say on almost every episode or many episodes anyway. Uh, so do get in contact with us. One of the things you mentioned, Jonathan, is the importance of knowing where the culture is today, of the importance of knowing the sexual revolution. And if you as a listener want to to, to learn more, to be to have an understanding of where we are today, why we got to where we are today, how so many of the issues that we're facing are interconnected in the different ways that they are, you can find Jonathan's book, The Culture War, at www.thebridgehead.ca. That's www.thebridgehead.ca. That's Jonathan's blog, where he also writes about a lot of these cultural issues and provides commentary from a pro-life, from a Christian perspective. So go check it out. That's www.thebridgehead.ca. There were some other links that were mentioned as well. Uh, The link for chapter one of Jonathan's book, Uh, The Culture War, we'll be putting that in the show notes. The link to an article that he referenced on Kinsey and uh, his research on children, we'll link that in the show notes as well. So be sure to check that out. Jonathan, thank you, sir, for taking the time not only to research this, uh, just as as Kim mentioned, wading through the gutters, uh, but also to share it with our audience, to share it with the audiences that you uh, engage with so that we can be aware of what's happening in our culture, of where the sexual revolution has come from, where it's gone, and, uh, and how we can fight against that. Yeah, it's always awesome to be on with you guys anytime. That was our conversation with Jonathan Van Maren. Go check out his blog, www.thebridgehead.ca. And on that website, go to the shop tab, and there you can buy The Culture War so that you too can be in the know of all the things it re- you know, with the sexual revolution, with pornog- the rise of pornography, and how all of those things are connected to abortion. What are some of your takeaways, Cam, as we uh, just finished that conversation with Jonathan? I So I I have always loved listening to not only Jonathan speak, but also reading his books. He's got several other books available on thebridgehead.ca. And one thing that I appreciate so much is how he not only provides so much of the background research, but also brings that down into concrete tools for engagement. As, as he mentioned, a lot of the content that he covered, maybe you don't regurgitate um, word for word in a conversation about abortion, but it can be incredibly useful in your interactions with people. Again, whether they may be friends, family members, random members of your community, helping you understand what is going on in our culture, understanding the brokenness. I Many interns that come through here, many of, of uh, our volunteers who have come from a, whether we want to call it a more sheltered kind of upbringing and whatnot, often ask the question, um, how could somebody support that? How could somebody support abortion? What is going on? And I think that Jonathan does such a great job of explaining how, while we're not giving them a free pass, that this is something that has been deeper and deeper ingrained into the minds of basically everybody in our society for the last three quarters of a century sort of thing. And so while we don't want to completely cut them loose and say, you know what, uh, it's not your fault. The fact that you've had three abortions or whatever, like we're not, we're not here to cast them into hell ourselves. We're also not here to forgive them of all of their sins ourselves. That's not our role, but it can help guide us in that conversation, knowing what kinds of filth have been poured into this person's life from every facet of society, not only media, not only the movies and Hollywood and whatever, but also tragically, probably from their parents um, and from their school systems and every other source of information they're getting their, their info from. And so these can be powerful tools for helping us navigate the culture war, giving us perspective for very real, very concrete conversations. And so that's what I take away. I think Jonathan does a phenomenal job of it. And so can't recommend enough going to his his daily columns that, that he's posting, not only on the bridgehead, but on countless other news outlets and whatnot. Um, great to have him back on the show. Absolutely. Yeah, I was looking forward to this conversation and he certainly did not disappoint. For the listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. We were we are extremely grateful and humble humbled that you continue to tune into our episodes. We'd love to know what you think, whether it be about this episode or whether it be about another one. And we'd love to know if you have any questions about some of the things that we've talked about. Perhaps you need clarification on something. We are here and we are ready to answer any of those questions that you might have. You can reach out to us on our social media platforms, be that Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or wherever you do your social media. Or you can reach out to us by connecting with us on our website, prolifeguys.com. That's www.prolifeguys.com. Just fill out the contact form 
and uh, and and write your comment, and we'll get back to you with what you know the best answer that we can come up with, and uh, and we can have that conversation. So do reach out to us. Let us know what you think. Let us know if you have any questions. If you're if you're listening on a podcast catcher, if you're watching on YouTube, thank you so much. Please hit that subscribe button so that you always stay in kind of in tune, in touch. Uh, stay on top of when we're bringing out new content. Uh, we have two episodes come out every single week and uh, and clicking that subscribe button will will kind of bring them to the top of your page and bring them on your feed on YouTube. So thank you so much for tuning in. We hope you tune in again next time. God bless you all.